Imagine for a moment that you're a hardworking family guy. You're 30 years old, no trouble with the law. One day in your neighborhood, there's a horrible murder. Police find a bandana near the bodies. And even though the local crime lab says that it can't tell whose DNA is on the bandana, a private company runs the evidence through a computer system and says, that DNA is yours. You're charged with the murder, and you're facing the death penalty. I bet that you would want to know exactly how that computer system works. And if the guy who built it and is now selling it for millions got up on the witness stand to describe it, you wouldn't trust him. You would want to see it for yourself. At least that's how Michael Robinson felt when all of this happened to him. He tried to subpoena the source code for the computer system so that he could determine whether it works the way its developer claims, without error, bias, or even Volkswagen-style fraud. <laughs> but the developer said that the source code was a trade secret, and refused to hand it over. Mr. Robinson was forced to defend his case without full access to the evidence against him. Our legal system guarantees criminal defendants certain rights. They have a right to confront the evidence against them and to compel evidence in their favor. They have a right to present a defense, which is basically a right to tell their own story about the evidence. It doesn't matter how improbable that story might seem to outsiders. And they have a right to do all of this in a public trial. Unfortunately, it doesn't always happen that way. Today, the criminal justice system is becoming automated. At every stage, from policing and investigations to bail, evidence, sentencing, and parole, computer systems guide outcomes. AI deploys cops on the beat. Audio sensors generate gunshot alerts. Forensic analysts rely on algorithms to match DNA, faces, fingerprints, and more. And risk assessment instruments help to determine who goes to prison and for how long. Now, just to be clear, <laughs> I'm neither for nor against these technologies. They might be good. They might be bad. I'm here to talk about something else. Ownership. Automation is driving privatization. Just like private prisons that have been found to undermaintain safety and security, or private police who operate with little oversight and training. New criminal justice technologies are primarily privately owned and sold for profit. Trade secrets are the intellectual property protection of choice for the developers of these technologies. And as a result, they often refuse to disclose details about how those tools work. Even to criminal defendants and their attorneys, even under a protective order, even in the controlled context of a courtroom proceeding. Trade secrets are black boxing criminal justice. Sorry, this is, <laughs> stick, pretend you didn't see that. <laughs> um, I work for the Legal Aid Society of New York City, defending criminal cases that involve computer-derived evidence. And I regularly see defendants denied access to information that they could use to cross-examine the evidence against them because somebody says it's a trade secret. So I'm gonna give you three examples. A few weeks ago, uh, this letter appeared on my desk. It's from an inmate at the Eastern Correctional Facility in upstate New York. This man had been in prison for 26 years, and he had a nearly perfect record of rehabilitation. For the past decade, he had not had a single disciplinary infraction. But last summer, he was denied parole. And the board said that the reason was that a computer system called Compass had given him a high score for prison misconduct. Now, something clearly failed <laughs> between zero disciplinary infractions and high score for prison misconduct. But the company that builds Compass considers the weights 
of its input variables to be trade secrets. So if one of those inputs is wrong, it's impossible to tell how it affects your final score. This man tried to challenge his compass result, but without being able to prove that the final score gave a distorted picture of his life, he couldn't convince anyone to fix it. Here's my second example, ShotSpotter. ShotSpotter is an audio surveillance system that's made up of audio sensors placed through a neighborhood that are supposed to send gunshot alerts to police. And for years, the company that sells ShotSpotter has told anyone who will listen, including police procurement committees, that human voices do not trigger ShotSpotter sensors. Apparently, what they meant to say was that the sensors record everything 24 hours a day and store those recordings for up to three days. Or at least <laughs> that's what one of their engineers told a court in Massachusetts after shot spotter recordings of human voices were introduced into evidence in a criminal case. Recording voice communications might violate constitutional privacy protections or wiretapping laws. But when defense attorneys have tried to subpoena information about how the sensors distinguish voice communications from ambient sound, they got this response. The company considers that information to be a trade secret. All right, for my third example, remember Michael Robinson. The um, company that built the DNA analysis software program used in his case. The program's called True Allele, in case you want to look it up. The developer of that program has submitted affidavits to courts across the country, saying that if he were forced to disclose the code for that program to defense attorneys under a protective order, it would be, quote, financially devastating for his company because it would allow competitors to steal his product. <sighs> Judges are falling in line with that view. In 2015, a California appeals court case applied a trade secrets evidentiary privilege to a criminal proceeding for what I believe is the first time in the nation's history in order to shield true allele source code from the defense. That case is now being cited in courts across the country. I've seen it in filings in New York to justify withholding trade secrets evidence from criminal defendants. And let's be clear, the defense attorneys in these cases have agreed to sign protective orders. One recently told a court, I've been a lawyer for 30 years, I've never violated a protective order. It didn't make a difference. The judge refused to order the code disclosed. Importing a trade secrets evidentiary privilege into criminal proceedings is harmful. In civil cases, it's risky to assert the privilege because a well-resourced adversary might challenge the validity of your trade secret and blow up all its value. But most criminal defendants don't have the resources to engage in that kind of complex IP litigation. And so it's easy for people to abuse the system by claiming protections for information when no valid trade secret exists. In fact, that's already happening right here in New York City. For years, the office of the chief medical examiner has refused to disclose source code in a software program that it developed in-house using taxpayer funds. It says, the code is a copyrighted and proprietary asset that belongs exclusively to the city of New York. And that its ownership interest is one reason it doesn't have to share the code. Now, this is ludicrous, right? A public lab has no legitimate commercial interest in withholding information from the accused. And last summer, a judge on the Southern District of New York called her bluff. She said, hand it over. An expert reviewing the code promptly found an undisclosed function that was likely to aid prosecutors. This is also new. Property rights do not generally let you withhold evidence from a criminal court. You can't decide you're not going to hand over your office stapler or your favorite t-shirt because you'd rather keep using it. Um, and it didn't used to be clear that you could even withhold trade secrets in a civil proceeding. 
Back in the day, there was a big fight between these two famous legal thinkers, John Henry Wigmore and Judge Learned Hand. Wigmore wanted to privilege trade secrets, Hand did not. They fought about it for about a quarter century until on the eve of Pearl Harbor, Wigmore accused his opponents of underappreciating United States military industry, like aircraft or chemical factories, and he won the debate. Even so, I have found no indication that anyone ever even considered applying that privilege in a criminal proceeding until the late 20th century, and no indication that anyone ever did until 2015. It's not how trade secrets law is supposed to work either. Intellectual property exists because we think that people will be more likely to invest in new ideas if they can stop their business competitors from free riding on the results. Think about this with me for a minute. If the law is designed to stop business competitors from stealing information, we apply that law to shield information from defense attorneys. What does that say about defense attorneys? Here are some of my colleagues at the Legal Aid Society. What does that say about them? Um, Michael Robinson was lucky. Last spring, a jury found him not guilty, went home to his family. Other defendants will not be so fortunate. How many innocent defendants will be wrongfully convicted based on trade secret evidence that they couldn't fully cross-examine. Right now, the United States Supreme Court is considering review in a case that raises a similar issue, Wisconsin versus Loomis. The defendant in that case is arguing that due process bars the government from sentencing somebody based on a trade secret tool. If the court declines review, or if it rules the wrong way, legislatures should step into the gap and pass laws that restrict safeguards for trade secrets evidence in criminal proceedings to a protective order and nothing more. If evidence is used against you, you should have a right to see and contest it. Thank you.